All right. So uh, welcome everybody who is joining us live. And for those of you who might be watching the recorded version of this later, thank you for attending. Uh, this is, I think, the fourth in a series of community workshops or discussions that we're hosting about this transition to online education that we were all um, perhaps less prepared for than we might have hoped uh, to help us understand what it's like with these tools, um, what our students were feeling, what one another are doing to host office hours or just get on with our teaching uh, and mentoring responsibilities. Um, you are joining us today because you're interested in hearing from a panel of graduate students about their experience. Uh, next week at this same time, place, and same registration link that you use to connect today, um, we'll be back with a panel of undergraduate students uh, to talk about what things look like from their experience. Um, for today, we've got a panel of, uh, of six graduate students who have agreed to share with us um, what their experience was like through this transition. Uh, and these folks represent a diversity of institutions, of research types, they're located all over the country. Um, and I've invited them to talk to all of us about their experience as learners. So some of these folks will talk about what it was like in the classroom as their instruction switched. Uh, some of these folks were TAs, and so they, had the, they also had the experience of trying to become online teachers and support our students that way. Uh, and all of these folks also have experience as part of research groups, and they have relationships with mentors and colleagues that will have been strained over the last few months. Um, so what we're going to do today uh, is I'll give just a quick introduction to each panelist, and then I'll ask them to spend three to five minutes. Um, they were, their goal was to reflect on, you know, two or three messages that they think would be helpful for faculty to hear or things that their mentors might not be aware of. Um, so this is a, a bold group of folks who are willing to share publicly and we appreciate that. Um, after that, uh, we'll open up the floor for a community discussion and our panel is here to answer whatever questions you all might have. Um, and you can communicate those questions to us in the chat box. So uh, along maybe right about there on your Zoom window, you can open up the chat box if you haven't done so. Um, and I'll just note, when you type in the chat box, it will just come to the panelists. Um, we, have, we have been Zoom bombed in the past, and so to make sure we're not broadcasting any of that content, uh, only the panelists will see what gets written in the chat, and then uh, myself or Skylar will copy and paste that so the questions can be seen by others. Uh, and I will try my best to MC this. Um, if you've got something that you want to go live to share with us, so I don't know, Mark, I see you're signed on. If Mark wants to, if Mark says, hey, I'd love to participate or I'd love to add something here, um, you could just let us know by typing that in the chat box. And Julia, who's uh, running the show from Quasi's end, can help make you a panelist. So you'll be able to turn on your mic and your video and just ask a question or contribute that way. Whew. All right, that's the rules of engagement. That's the business. Uh, let's see. So alphabetically here, um, so we're gonna start with Hisham. Uh, and Hisham, you're joining us from the University of Washington. So if you'd like to give a quick introduction and then share your thoughts, uh, we're ready to hear from you. Okay, thanks Adam. Yeah, thanks for giving us the uh, opportunity to share our experience for uh, online teaching. So um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington in the civil environmental engineering. And uh, I'm happy, you know, to share my experience for, as a teaching assistant, I was, I'm teaching assistant for a design, you know, the capstone design course. So I've done that last year it was in class and also this year as like online you know so it was a good experience to know how the students are feeling about that so i would like to share like a couple of points for like you know it's online has like a pros and cons and what i'd like to share today like the feedback from students and as well from instructors and one 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 big challenge that the students are mentioning is like you know having this course as interactive you know or getting actively engaged in the class and I mean, this is a, I think it's, everyone knows about this for, especially for the online courses and for the capstone, especially, you know, because the capstone has no like kind of teaching any concepts or any theoretical things that are theoretical. It's more about like group discussions and having, you know, invited speakers and so on. So this, this was a big challenge for this class actually. And um, 
some, some students are saying also, like they are not able to keep in the focus in the class, you know, because I mean, they just joined the meeting on Zoom or something, but some, some of them, they sometimes, they, you know, they lost their focus during the class. And, and uh, um, this is uh, like kind of like a big challenge for them as well. Um, another thing is like, because in this course we have many invited speakers. So students are saying, and when, it, when it's a, an in-person class, they have more opportunity to interact with the, with the invited speakers. And I mean, probably in terms of building like a professional network or something. But like now, you know, we, we just invite a speaker and the speaker start talking and then probably answering the question after having the presentation. But then, you know, they, they don't have the chance, you know, to get interacting more in, in person, especially in person with the invited speakers. Uh, some of the pros, you know, about for the online teaching, the most of the students, they like this kind of having breakout rooms, which is like a feature here in Zoom. They like this. They said it's very useful, you know, when having like small group discussions. So this is a very, it's very useful for them. And um, another thing is actually the setup of the class. So the setup of the class, I mean like the structure of the class, which is probably different from one course to another. And this might be something we need to consider in the future. Some, some of the courses, they are like the students are getting the recording before the class, which is helpful for them to, to, to watch it before the class. And then the class may be a kind of a and a session. So this is something I think it's the students like it, you know, when they have the, the recording before the class. So, I mean, based on my, on the feedback, I got it, I got it from the students and instructors. I just want to share some recommendations, just a couple of points. I think one, one thing we might need to think about in the future, maybe we might need like a kind of a training for the instructors. So I'm thinking like, especially the summer is coming and I think the summer is a good, is a good time if we, we have now the like feedback, a good feedback for this, this semester from the students. So we can have like maybe a training for the instructors. I mean, the instructors, like maybe the faculty and as well, like the teaching assistant, like, like someone like me, you know, I mean, we might need like a training for, uh, to, to, to make this process, you know, improve based on the feedback from the students. And uh, another thing is like, you know, we, we shifted for the, the online because of the, the COVID, but maybe in the future, we might need to think also about a combination between both of them, the in-class and also the online, you know, because both of them, they have, you know, their own advantages and disadvantages. So maybe having more active learning, maybe by combining both of them together. Um, one thing I was thinking about if, do we need more features to be added to this applications like Zoom or Skype or something, do we need more features? As, like people saying they like these breakout rooms. So I'm thinking, okay, what else can we add? So we improve these applications themselves, you know, we can improve the applications and making this process more, you know, more interactive probably. And uh, yeah, the last uh, thing I, I just wanna, when I say that our evaluation is conditioned by the COVID, you know, we don't want to say that the online, you know, online teaching is, this is, is not good, you know, but because most of the opinions we are getting, it's, it's related of the COVID situation. Some, some, some people are saying we don't like it because they are just, because of the stay at home order, you know, they are just staying at home. So it's a kind they don't, that's why, that's one reason they don't like it, you know. And the other thing, it probably, you know, it's, it's a kind of a human nature that they are kind of resisting to change. So I would say like, if this, this, this spring, we get the feedback that they don't like it, maybe in the fall, if we have the online teaching again, I think, I mean, I would assume that we might get a better results. Yeah, that's, I think, uh, yeah, all I have, yeah. Great, all right, thanks, Hisham. Yeah. Um, so yeah. next, uh, I'd like to go to Karen Emanuelson from Colorado State University. Thanks, Adam, and uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I'll kind of speak from the perspective of still in being enrolled in classes and how that looked. Um, as a graduate student. And so I was enrolled in two different classes and had two radically different experiences. Um, the first experience, my professor kept everything the same, all of our deadlines. We met twice a week via Zoom. Um, it was a small discussion-based class, um, only including graduate students. So I think that was one of the reasons she was able to kind of just push forward. Um, but I just wanted to bring up how having that class regularly scheduled and keeping the expectations the same as when we met in person really helped with the transition. And I think every single student in that class said something similarly on the last day. Um, 
the expectation was that you showed up um, prepared and you discussed. We also used the breakout room um, for kind of smaller group discussions. Uh, she actually had students uh, present each class um, and we went ahead with that and it worked great. And it also gave us an opportunity to be kind of that facilitator um, and to build those skills that I think moving forward, we need to know how to be a, a good virtual worker. And so this was a safe space to kind of see what worked, see what didn't work, um, and really prepare us for kind of moving forward. On the other hand, I was in um, an engineering class that was much more, it's quantitative, lecture-based. Um, that kind of didn't go quite as well. Uh, the second half of the semester, we were primarily going out to see river restoration sites, um, meet community partners, get guest lectures, um, and obviously all of that couldn't go forward. Um, so at no fault to the professor, he tried to come up with a different plan. We did kind of discussion posts. Um, his goal was to make it as flexible as possible, knowing we weren't necessarily going to get what we initially anticipated out of the course. Um, and so he wanted, we still did our big final project. He was available um, to meet via, he used Microsoft Teams. Um, to kind of help us move forward and figure out our models and, and be able to complete that project. But I do feel like as a class, we missed out on a lot of material. And he would say that himself, the professor, um, we're all invited back next spring to actually go and <laughs> see these sites and meet these community partners. Um, but I guess as a general takeaway, there's certain courses that work really well. And I think you can kind of push the bounds of the tools we have to get the most, but unfortunately, there's other classes that don't necessarily translate in the same way. Um, one final aspect I wanted to bring to um, light was kind of mentorship. So myself with my advisor, pretty much the same. We meet, we talk weekly. Um, I'm also a part of a multi-institution team. So we've already been doing Zoom calls bi-weekly. Um, there was no change there, but what I notice and miss the most is that student-to-student -student interaction. Um, both, you know, being able to turn to my office mate and ask for code help, um, and also kind of working with new students to teach them how to calibrate instrumentation. We're still doing these tasks, but now it's a phone conversation you know, people are in different places and you're, you're looking for calibration solution in a, a field lab, which are notoriously not the, the most organized. Um, and so that I've, I've tried to overcome by, you know, making those phone calls more frequently, reaching out, scheduling one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings um, with people I know that are working on similar projects. Um, and then there's also been this other bonus. Um, normally, I'm kind of limited, or I kept myself limited to the students in my own organization. But one thing that's come to light is being a part of a, a earth science coding kind of open session every Thursday morning. And all of the students, or most of the students, are in North Carolina at various universities. And so this has been a new opportunity to learn different skills from different students that I wouldn't normally interact with. So I think there's pros and cons and we really have to work to make the most of this situation. Aaron, that was great, thank you. Um, all right, uh, we're gonna stick in Colorado, um, but we're gonna switch to Colorado School of Mines now. Uh, and Victoria Hennen, that means you're up. Hi everyone, Th I'm happy to be here. Um, so yeah, so I just finished my first year of my master's thesis. Um, it was a really, it was challenging to transition to the online classes. I had three classes this semester and they were all very structured differently. My first class was a watershed modeling class that heavily depended on VPN access and using lab computers and using all this different software that would occasionally crash. And that was really challenging, but um, the professor was really good about being flexible and understanding. 
Um, I personally know like a lot of students fell behind, but no marks were taken off because of late work, um, which was really nice. I know some students really struggled with like the coding part of it. And if they hadn't had experience in coding, like one of the labs was completely MATLAB and it's, th there's just not a lot of, um, <clears throat> it's hard to get help when you're so remote and you can't physically be there at office hours. And, um, but like I said, the professor was very flexible. So that was really nice. The other, another class I was in was a lot of group work and that went relatively well. The class met twice a week and I really liked that. I like how it was structured every week at 3 p.m. I mean, every other day at 3 p.m. we would meet. Um, he would either give a lecture or we would discuss a paper that we all read. And we had assignments where we collaborated and did like a review of a paper together. Um, I personally didn't have problems with other students, but I know other people who did. And like this one student really, really struggled throughout the semester. And this one girl was working with him and he did absolutely no work. And she had to talk to the professor and it was, I'm not really sure how that was resolved, but it was, I'm sure that's happening in other classes too. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last class I was in was a more traditional structured class where we had lectures and homework, homeworks and exams. Um, we didn't meet over Zoom. It was just a lecture that was downloaded um, from Canvas that we watched that we were just, I don't know, I kind of felt lost in that class. It was hard to stay on a schedule. Um, and the exams were not open note um, and they were like discussion, like you, you write a uh, short answer exams. And I know, I know there was cheating for sure. I wasn't friends with any of the people in the class. So it, like, I, I didn't really hear about it, but it's just something that I wish the professor did maybe like an essay instead of an exam um, because the exam averages were way higher than the first exam that was done before this COVID nonsense. Um, so I think like if that professor had to do it again, I would tell her to maybe have like a Q&A session at least once a week so we could meet face to face and um, have maybe a paper instead of short answer exams um, to stop that potential cheating because it's unfair to students who don't cheat. Um, yeah, it was, it's interesting. It was really hard to fit in research during this time, but my advisor was very um, understanding of it all. We had this thing called Scram, which is Scrum at Minds. And if you don't know what Scrum is, it means it's just a check-in with a research group or any kind of group where you kind of tell everyone what you did the day before and what you plan to do. And it just gives some responsibility on yourself and on other people and it helps you stay on track. And it's also just an opportunity to see your research group face to face. And we would do this Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, which I didn't attend every session. You don't have to attend every session, but it was definitely helpful to see other people in my research group um, because it's definitely there's a loss of connection and it's really challenging to bridge that gap. But yeah, that's, that's what I have. Thank you, Victoria. Um, all right. And next we're going to go to David Litwin out at Johns Hopkins. Hi, thanks for inviting me, Adam. Um, as you said, I'm a, I'm a PhD student at Johns Hopkins and I thought I would talk a little bit about a course that I think was really successful. And then I'll talk a little bit about my experience with research group and mentorship. Um, so the course that, uh, that I took that I think was really successful was a kind of traditional quantitative course with um, lectures uh, with a good amount of equations and derivations and stuff like that. Um, and uh, there was a little bit of a scramble in that first 
week or two when everything transitioned. But um, what, uh, what we wound up settling on was an, uh, a synchronous class that was recorded, um, but to my knowledge, virtually everyone attended synchronously. Um, and uh, the format was basically to do uh, written notes on a OneNote tablet. Um, along with some kind of mixed in uh, kind of code and showing figures from code. Um, and uh, a few things that I thought were really successful about that. Uh, first of all, having at least a synchronous, synchronous option um, was really important for me. Like if it's not synchronous, um, attention, which is already a problem with online stuff, just gets even worse. Like it's, it's so easy to not justify um, your kind of undivided attention if it isn't synchronous. Um, and uh, the second thing that I think I find in courses in general, but is even more the case with online courses, is um, actually writing out the notes, which it, I mean, it, it may seem like a silly thing to do if you're already going to be online anyways, why not just use a presentation? But um, being able to follow along and not have your eyes glaze over when you see a full page of something pull up in front of you um, is, is really important. And I think um, has even some potential for value added if you get good at OneNote. Um, there's opportunity to draw more detailed figures and use color and make something that is also available afterwards. Um, if you want to kind of like look at the notes that were done on the board uh, during class. Um, so, so those are my main thoughts on that course. Uh, Kind of like Victoria said, we had a we had a short answer exam um, for our final that was take home, and and it was open note, open book, um, which I think definitely helps. I don't know about any cheating, but that's another funny thing about online. I mean, we would never know because we don't actually talk with anyone else. Um, but but I think there was a certain advantage to that style of exam in that the types of questions that we could be asked um, allowed us to explore things with code and maybe go into a little bit more detail on things that a paper in class exam couldn't really afford. Um, and then lastly, kind of in agreement with some other people, what other people have said about um, mentorship, uh, I think it's been really helpful to have regularly scheduled check-ins. And even if you don't have anything in particular to say or to show from, from your research at that point, um, just having the consistency of it, even if you're just gonna you know, show up and talk about your advisor's baby, um, that's, you know, that's not, not so bad, at least for me, that's helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, I think finding opportunities for interaction with other grad students is critical. And mm -hmm. if it remains this way, hopefully not too much longer, but it seems like through the summer, um, coming up with ways, whether it's the, that kind of scram sort of thing or others to to interact in the short term, like setting goals. And then also um, in the long term, I found it really helpful to have more extended work sessions, even if you're not talking or really working on the same thing, just having other people there, even virtually there can be helpful. That covers it for me, I think. Thanks, David. Uh, let's see, Kyle Smart out at Kent State. I've got you up next. Hi there. So, uh, like Victoria, I'm just finishing my first year of a master's program here at Kent State. Um, so I study some um, 
some pedogenesis of uh, mine soil. Um, and I'd, I have a few things I wanted to talk about quickly. Um, so I want to discuss, um, I was taking part in two watershed um, and uh, water cycle type courses. Um, one of them continued to meet synchronously. Um, and this was like really possible because uh, it was a seminar based, just grad, strictly grad course. And then the other one was asynchronous meetings. Um, and this was a mixed grad and undergrad level course. Um, so uh, just discussing that quickly, I think that in my own personal experience, the meeting synchronously is definitely much more um, uh, successful in terms of maintaining a schedule and getting like, assignments turned in on time. It does make it a lot easier to um, maintain focus um, and motivation in the course. Um, and I know that the limitations of that are, again, like strictly grad versus grad undergrad. Um, it is challenging to continue um, synchronous meetings with undergrads as a lot of them are traveling back home from the university to various parts of the world with different time zones. That can be a significant challenge. Um, and I think that um, with the seminar type course, which is strictly grad, um, there are a lot of options uh, in terms of tools that we already have available to utilize. Um, it's just that because we are traditionally meeting in a face-to-face -face setting, we may not be as um, as skilled in like adapting what we already have in terms of course content into uh, this remote meeting types uh, type of course. Um, and also, I wanted to talk about the being a TA. So I was TAing a geomorphology lab for this semester and. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with that was trying to adapt the course content. Um, and the funny thing is that the courses were heavily technology based to begin with. Um, but because of that, a lot of the lab was spent helping students work through technical difficulties with some of the programs that were being used. And this is a lot more challenging when you're working remotely than if you were to just be able to kind of lean over and direct them to do the proper steps or um, I think a lot of focus and um, making like explanation of certain uh, concepts is a lot more simple in person because you're more directly engaged in the conversation. Um, uh, I, I definitely find that reading something on a screen is a lot more challenging in terms of absorbing the material. Um, so I think the same way with conversation, it's a lot harder to absorb the content of a conversation or lecture when it's on a screen than it is when you're in person. Um, uh, a quick note about like being advised as a grad student, my uh, advisor was already on sabbatical this semester. So we were already meeting remotely um, via Skype and over email. So that wasn't too much of a transition for me. However, uh, now my advisor is uh, still uh, kind of stuck abroad as international travel isn't really allowed at this time. So um, getting my project up and running has been a challenge because again, I, this is my spring semester of my first year. So I haven't been able to go out and get field samples yet mm -hmm. as that hasn't been allowed. So kind of working on trying to adapt my project and doing some remote or a lot of background research and some prior analysis. So that's been quite a challenge, but um, so thanks for having me here. And that's pretty much what I have. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, and one more panelist to share her thoughts with us. Uh, we'll go to Krista Torrens out at the University of Colorado. Thanks, Adam. I, I appreciate being here. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Colorado, and um, I wanted to talk briefly about my experiences both as a student in a class and as a TA. First, the class that I took transferred really well to online, I thought. It was a graduate seminar on ecological forecasting that was very project focused. So we had already broken into small groups and were working on our group projects by the time we had to transition to online. Um, and that, that transition went really smoothly. I think the things that we missed out on were interactions with the other groups. I mean, once, once we were online, we were pretty much just interacting with our group, with the instructor who would bounce from group to group, and with a couple of mentors that were part of the class structure. Uh, and yeah, there were other groups that were doing similar things. We definitely could have benefited from cross-pollination, and that just 
didn't happen. A similar theme to, you know, losing the interactions and the connections that you get with on person, with in person rather. Um, and as a TA, I was teaching a general biology lab, which is by nature really, really hands on. Um, things I think that went well about the transition process with that is that it's also a really large course with a lot of TAs and that worked as a coordinated unit. We split into groups and had four people working on creating a learning module for each of the remaining labs and the last quiz. Um, and that allowed us to really focus our time and energy on making one module really solid. And I think that helped everyone. I mean, that's going through all of the modules, they were, um, it would, it would be hard to imagine doing them better. And I certainly could not have done nearly as good a job if I had had to put each and every class online myself. Um, as it was, TAing took a lot longer just because missing that in-person contact with students and the opportunity to meet and say things once and make it really clear what the expectations were, people just missed that. I have spent, and this was a common um, theme of, around the department and around the others that were teaching this course. Like we had a lot more individual emails from students, even if we put out announcements or tried to convey the information to everybody in the same way. Um, the, the folk, it was a much more scattered experience for everybody and there was a lot of repetition. Moving forward, I'm gonna be teaching another you know, online, another hands-on class that has been moved to online, and I'm gonna try some sort of a virtual platform that has the opportunity for chat and interaction. It'll still be asynchronous because of the nature of the class. There was really not a good way to have everybody presenting the information in individual lab sessions. You know, There was no one time everybody could meet because the class itself had been spread out across so many different lab sections. Um, but having some sort of a unifying format might help mitigate some of that and help give students the opportunity to both answer each other's questions if they think they have the answer and to see an answer, like search for an answer that's already been given. And that might make things easier on everybody, having a resource where people could go. Because there were some students that just also kind of dropped off the face of the earth. And I don't think that was um, related to synchronous or asynchronous as much as it just was to they, I, the people I did hear from had a lot going on, like just an incredible amount of stuff going on. Um, in their personal lives that made it more difficult for them to focus, not least related to, you know, traveling home across the country, across the planet, having family members who were sick, having family members who had other non-COVID related issues, but there suddenly you are in the same house with them. Yeah. Technology issues, like there were, there was a host of issues that are not necessarily related to online learning, but that are totally related to this particular situation. Um, that made it hard for people to reach out and get help that they needed. And maybe if there was a repository that they could have just accessed in their own time, maybe it would have been easier. Um, but yeah, and one final, uh, one other piece I wanted to touch on, one of the things that I, another tool that made it successful, I think, for the labs was utilizing um, other technologies and being creative. And again, being able to focus on just putting one class online made it easier to do this. But the lab that I put online was population ecology. We were, students were supposed to walk around a section of the campus looking for plastic owls. And instead we put that on Google Earth so they could walk a transect and find the owls and identify them in the same way. And that, um, the feedback we got from students was that doing things like that really helped them feel like they were still doing the lab and getting more of an in-person hands-on experience with it. Um, awesome. Yeah, and There's I guess, I, sorry, just one final okay. thought. Like this, 
there's a real difference between courses that are designed to be online courses and courses that are being shoved into an online format because that's what we have to do. And I, I think it's important to recognize that and to recognize that there's no way that a course that's designed to be hands-on is going to be an effective online, you know, it's not going to be 100% effective online. Um, and it's important for everyone to recognize that you're just doing the best you can. Thanks, Krista. And that, that very last words from you actually feels great to hear as an instructor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so Skylar and I are going to try to help facilitate some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so we're going to go to, uh, for folks who have questions or things you want to contribute, please go ahead and type those in the chat box and we will take them in the order they're coming. Um, so Mark, if you'd want to go ahead and kind of unmute and ask your question, then we'll let our panelists feel that. And Julia, if you would add Kamini Singha to the panel so she could ask her question next. Go ahead, Mark. Hey. Um, so thanks for, for inviting me here and for, for taking this question. Um, and this really touches on uh, some of Karen's experiences and then some of Krista's too, uh, is that I'd like to do a little bit of a deeper dive, if you could, into some of the things that happen with classes that really seem like they shouldn't be online. Um, and so this is something like, you know, site visits, uh, like a biology lab. I was teaching field methods for hydrology. And, you know, how do you, you do that online? Mm -hmm. So if you, <clears throat> if you don't mind, um, elaborating a little bit on some of the experiences. Uh, I'd love to, to hear more about, about what you did. I can start that off, but I will say I was thinking about this question and listening to Krista and it seemed like she has a lot of good thing, um, things to add as well. What I had wished most for is that we tried some something. And um, it kind of seems like this class moved more into like a safer space, having us read some papers and try to discuss them um, via like chats. And um, I, as a grad student, I recognize that this class isn't necessarily perfect for an online format. And I would have loved to like try to reach out to community partners to see if they could have given us a virtual tour mm -hmm. or, you know, just even if we all understood it might not have been perfect, um, it, I think there's a missed opportunity to just like test it out and see how it went. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a grad student class that's smaller in size is a really good place to test that. But then I also was kind of just brainstorming. Um, my advisor teaches probably a very similar field, hydrology field methods course um, that's slated for this fall. And we, discussed a little bit on like what and or how we could move it online. Um, and I guess if there's like enough sensors, I know we have like these little DO sensors, they're expensive, but if you could give students, um, I don't know, like a hobo logger or a DO sensor and let them have that in their home and maybe they go through the calibration. I mean, a lot of what we do is read those instruction manuals, we mess it up three times and finally we get something that mm -hmm. we know is accurate. Mm -hmm. And I think troubleshooting that would be maybe one of the most important field methods that you could teach a student. They're always gonna be using different sensors and so learning how to learn how to use it could be really valuable. Mm -hmm. And then maybe also you have them with different sensors presenting, because um, that's the other, it's not a very good thing to lecture on, because when you learn is when it doesn't work. And so they could share some of those experiences on what didn't work and how they even knew it wasn't working. Um, and those kind of aha moments that came up authentically might be good learning tools um, to share with the class. And that's as much as I can spitball without <laughs> thinking more about that. <laughs> Karen, that's great. Any, uh, any other panelists want to jump in? Other thoughts about how to do a field or a lab-based course in this, in this new setup? Krista, yeah. Yeah, I, I think what Karen said is great. Um, one thing that we did with the 
uh, general biology labs is we had an actual methods video where people who were creating that module went out and showed, like demonstrated and talked through the methods. It's not the same as doing them, obviously. So, you know, like for stream ecology, they showed how to sample for macroinvertebrates, but that doesn't give students the actual sense of doing it. And that'll work well for some learning styles, but not others. Like people who are kinesthetic learners kind of really missed out in this time. But, um, but it at least gave a solid overview and a revisitable reference for how to do things. They also showed videos of the sorted macroinvertebrates and walked them, you know, walked people through the identification key for a couple of them and then showed different images and said, there are six of these. Look at these features. What do you think that is? Mark it down on your data sheet. So doing your best to make it um, a realistic experience, whatever that means, whether it's having a virtual tour of a site or um, showing them the actual results or methods or techniques and having them go through a, an online calibration or if you can get them something physical to actually hold, that would be ideal. That might be a tough, tough thing with a sensor, depending on how large your class is. <laughs> But yeah, being flexible and creative and doing your best to recreate that in-person experience and recognizing that it won't be perfect is, would be my suggestion yeah. in a nutshell. I think that's a big part of it. And really, Karen's mention of doing something wrong 30 times um, is such a big part of that class. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they didn't have the opportunity to do, to do that. And that was, that was something that was, they really missed out on, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we're going to go on to a question from Kamani Singha. So Kamani, if you want to ask a question. Sure thing. Actually, you know, now that I've got this great group of people here, Mark's question has totally inspired me to ask a completely different question than the one I put in the chat box. But um, <laughs> I was asking about evaluation and I am interested about that. But maybe since I've got this great group of folks, I'm curious if there's something that you guys have used, I guess, that I was just thinking about Victoria's point about engaging differently, like needing the VPN. Were there tools that really helped you guys engage in the online environment right now, like a, I don't know, a smartphone app or website that was really helpful to you in one way or another that sort of fundamentally helped your learning right now? I can take this or part of it. If, um, so I, we had a little bit of experience with using an online uh, tool called Perusal. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Um, it was really good for the seminar based course where it was a lot of paper discussion. So this kind of allows you to get in and make comments directly on the PDF of the paper and you guys can go back and forth and have discussions right on like the sidebar kind of, um, and that, that was beneficial. Um, another great tool is just Google documents. Um, again, with the, sem the seminar type course, um, my professor was able to get some of the people, the authors of the papers that we were discussing to actually be a guest speaker in some of these like online sessions. Mm -hmm. And that was really beneficial um, because you really get more of a different perspective in terms of um, what the author was trying to convey. We're not always the best at doing that in a like scientific paper. Um, and again, like you're going to get the important data across, but that's not necessarily like a lot of the concepts and some of the like, some more secondary meaningful concepts that you're trying to get across with the study that you're doing because you have to water it down so much to get um you know a short enough article published so that was really beneficial in terms of like getting these guest speakers and that uh perusal was also very helpful in terms of meeting asynchronously uh prior to and preparing for something that was occurring synchronously so that's what i have Anybody right. on the panel want to want to jump in and contribute? Hey, Victoria, I might ask you to address the um, assessment portion too. I think there, there have been a lot of professors trying to bend over backwards to make uh, deadlines more flexible and make it more make it easier for students to um, you know complete content at their pace and at their schedule. But then it's kind of painful to see your other point about you know cheating and how do we balance uh, accommodations with still being fair to students that are, you know, trying to do their best, honestly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so first, I just want to say that it's not really, it didn't help me 
learn, but my research group used Slack and Slack, we made a Slack um, workspace for, and at the start of this COVID-19, and it was a really good way to interact with um, other research group members about like coding questions, but also just sending pictures of our dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. um, really good way to just get away from everything else and just come online and, and interact with them. Um, in terms of the working, yeah. I don't know, I think like everyone was just doing their best. Um, really like, I don't know, I really don't know how to answer the question um, that you had Skylar, but yeah, it's tricky. Can, yeah, Krista, <laughs> you wanna well, I, I mean, I think what comes to mind for me is that it's not gonna work that well to do things that are not open book, you know, that are supposed to be some sort of testing exam where you have a limited time. We have a um, software platform, a learning platform, Canvas, that we used for this class and for classes across the university, which was really helpful in a lot of ways and could give you timed, you know, quizzes or exams, but that's not gonna keep people from cheating if they're going to cheat. So we just made everything open book. Um, or shifted to more project-based or essay-based write-up assessments. Um, I really don't know. I, there are proctoring platforms also, but those seem really invasive, like from what I've read about them, and I couldn't in good faith recommend them. Like they, you know, they don't allow you to go to the bathroom in the middle of a long exam. They monitor you with a camera. It just I don't think there's a good and um, a good way to have a proctored exam. You know, you can't count on some people not cheating. So I think we need to shift away from that for online assessment, online course assessments. Yeah, I agree. Um, either having an open book or just having something like maybe a paper instead of an exam um, would be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I even know someone a professor from University of Portland who was teaching a semester coding class for freshman students. And she said there was a huge cheating ring. Everyone was copying code for a quiz. Um, there were like 25 students sharing code. Um, I don't know how that was resolved, but it's just really hard when you have students have access to each other, like behind mm -hmm. the professor's back. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's happening everywhere. So I'll, um, I saw another question that came in uh, to the chat box here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of riff on what came into us a little bit. Um, so I heard I heard a couple of you talking about the idea that you know it's you liked when things were tried, right? When people were making an effort, trying new and different things, right? I I, I heard that message from a few people, but then we got a question in that sort of says. Uh, hey, I, I did this. I'm teaching an introduction to soils course. I used some YouTube content to try to help explain things. Uh, and from the instructor's perspective, it didn't work well and students thought it was not a great instructional tool. It was maybe hard to follow. So how do we, how do we, how should we know the difference as instructors? What's, what's good trying and what's bad trying? <laughs> or, or what are the, what are the things we definitely need to watch out for? I'll put a little bit in. Um, I think that's where feedback's really important and having like an open avenue. So if it doesn't work, that just keeps it to one lesson that didn't work well and you know that needs to be improved on next time rather than this spiral of lesson after lesson that isn't like hitting home. And so maybe just asking the students, again, it depends on the level and I, fully recognize that. And I think that's why next week will be important with the undergrads. But as mm -hmm. graduate students and your TAs, um, yeah, kind of, you know, do a little self-evaluation each week before you move forward to try to combat that. And I appreciate you trying. Yeah. Yeah, Krista, go ahead. 
Yeah, this, this is perhaps particular to my situation, but um, if you can expand it to yours, it might be helpful. Having a large TA group, we most of us went through each lab before it was made public. People who didn't create the lab went through the lab and looked for things that didn't work or seemed confusing. Um, and I think that helped weed out some of the problems like that. So if, if there is any one or any group that you could show the module to before you make it live, that might give you feedback on, yeah, I couldn't see the images. It was confusing. It didn't work. It wouldn't load. It was the wrong link, <laughs> whatever. Um, that said, there's bound to still be a few things that slip through, but the more sort of peer review you can get, the, the better it seemed to go. Hey, Sham, go ahead. Uh, you're muted right now. There you go. Go. I just wanted to restate what Karen said about the evaluation, I think, probably maybe for the online teaching especially, might need like more frequently evaluation because I remember, I mean, most of the classes I took, the evaluation is in the last week. And this, it's, I think that's maybe one reason why sometimes evaluation doesn't, doesn't work, you know, if we just wait for the last week. So I, I would say maybe more frequently evaluation, but at the same time, tr trying to make it, making it short, you know, because when it's too long, sometimes we just feel the evaluation to, to trying to finish it, but maybe making it short and more frequently during the, the semester. So I have um, one question that I want to, that hasn't been talked about in the Q&A here too much uh, that came in from the Twitter solicitations we had put out. Um, and this was a student who says, and I'll, I'll paraphrase this, uh, essentially the, the connections I had with my lab mates and with my fellow students were the best part of my graduate experience. How do current, and, and this is a, a person who's graduated now, uh, how are the current students maintaining that kind of community in the face of this pandemic? Um, and I know a few of you talked about it via Slack and so on, but I'd, I'd love to hear what you all are doing to try to keep your communities and your, your support networks alive. Um, I think that's one of the things that, that is important for instructors and mentors to realize is the, the isolation uh, piece of this puzzle and the, just the fracturing. So any, Anyone who wants to sort of go on that subject, um, I'd, I'd welcome input as to how you are keeping that alive. David, I see your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there, there are a lot of different options, none of which are as good as in person, but um, <laughs> everything from, from really work focused things like having Slack groups, um, although that can get disruptive sometimes if, if you have notifications on and you're actually trying to get stuff done. Um, to um, groups where you're all, you know, sitting down at a particular time to work on things. Um, to kind of more recreational things, like I have, uh, I have a Facebook group where whole bunch of grad students share both funny stuff and also coordinate um, doing things together like online trivias and happy hours. Um, and some of that has been coordinated by the department as well, um, which, is, which is helpful. And, but, you know, with anything else, a lot more people will fall off the map and not show up um, to those than otherwise. So you have to find ways ideally to reach those people as well. Um, and, you know, maybe that's even just checking in with fellow grad students you haven't heard from. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing that's uh, kind of funny, but I've also found beneficial is that uh, I, I kind of have two homes. I have a home at University of Colorado, and I also have a home at Johns Hopkins. And um, what the pandemic has allowed is for me to continue to attend stuff at University of Colorado, even though I'm back in Baltimore. Um, so I think there are opportunities to, um, as someone else said, build connections with other universities. Um, this, this can get exhausting. There is absolutely too much stuff out there for you to do all of it. Um, 
but if you pick and choose and make commitments to those things, so you might actually you know, get to know people in a way that's meaningful in the long run, um, then I think that's very constructive. Great, Any other, anybody else on our panel wanna share? I would just add, I completely agree with everything David said there. And also um, a few of the panelists have mentioned like the importance of non-business connection. So yeah, like the Slack channel, the send, the funny photos. But um, this is where I think um, that like mentor-mentee relationship really comes in and knowing your students. Um, I personally am somebody ha that has no problem reaching out to others. Um, and I've been enjoying that, but you have a mentee that you know might not have that personality. And I think that's something most people know. Encouraging them, almost giving them like an assignment to connect with whether it's one person they normally would interact with or like the author of their favorite paper. Um, and, and treating that similar to research where you like check in on it and see how it goes um, to try to encourage some students that might not make those relationships on their own happen um, could be really valuable. And I've found it's an amazing time to reach out to somebody that you don't know at all because everybody is kind of missing this personal interaction. Schedules are a lot more flexible. So getting 30 minutes of a uh, time with your favorite scientist is possible right now. And so to try to make that happen could be a huge benefit. You know, I'll add there's a, I think from the team building literature, there's a pretty common finding that if you don't have a good personal relationship and comfortability with your team, with your boss, with whoever, then you won't be able to really work effectively together when the time comes to ask detailed work questions, so. Mm -hmm. So I want to be um, I want to be respectful of people's time. We said we'd go till one p.m. Uh, and I just saw my my clock tick over on the computer. Um, so just by way of a couple orders of business. Um, so one, uh, we will ba be back in this exact same link with the registration you've already used um, with a panel of undergraduate students next week to hear about their experiences. Um, and more importantly than that, I really want to sincerely thank our panelists today. Um, so Hisham, Karen, Victoria, David, Kyle, and Krista, you all were willing to put yourselves out there as graduate students speaking in a panel for a bunch of faculty members and telling us what we can do better. Uh, and that is a bold and brave place to put yourselves. And I surely appreciate your time and input. Um, and for those who might have missed something today uh, or those uh, who you think would benefit from seeing this, um, Quasi has been recording this. And so we will get this posted online uh, in the coming days so that it exists as a resource for others. So thank you so much to panelists again, and thank you to the folks who attended. We hope that this is helpful for you. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody back here in a week. Thanks everybody. Thanks Adam. Thanks all.